2 Samuel. And I think we're in chapter 7. I believe that's where we pulled over and parked last time. <laughs> Yeah, chapter 7. So, uh, everybody has their Bible and have your book open and very good. Oh, I like sitting here like this. This is casual. All right, so we're going to continue now. You might remember last week there were some great victories that took place uh, with David and they relocated the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you might remember the story about how David was dancing and just worshiping God. He was just feeling free. Uh, and of course, you know, it seems like sometimes when we um, have that kind of a, a free experience, there might always be those who are looking on and might they might say, oh man, that guy's weird. You know, or that's inappropriate or whatever. And of course, we learned last week that his wife was very critical in her spirit. So uh, she tried to disrespect him for da uh, dancing like he did. But uh, we found out also that um, because of that, um, she was unable to have children until the day of her death. So we'll pick it up. Verse 1, chapter 7. Now it came to pass... When the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the Lord dwells inside tent curtains. And then Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? So David's kind of eyeing the, the, the circumstances around him, and he, he's come to the understanding that, you know, ever since the beginning, um, the Ark of the Covenant has been moved from place to place. It's dwelt in tents. It's traveled around with the people wherever they went. And it never really had a formal uh, resting place. And David, you know, has a desire to make a place for the ark that they might keep it there uh, permanently. How many times do we come up with a great idea and we think, oh, yeah, you know, I can really jump in and I can do this because it seems like something that really needs to be done. And I really want to step in there and I want to go for it wholeheartedly. But there's one thing that we forget to do during the process, and that is pray. We see a perfect example of that before us tonight. Whenever you set out to do something that you feel maybe God's putting it on your heart or you just come up with a brilliant idea or whatever it might be, it's always good before you step out into it that you spend a little bit of time seeking the Lord and, and asking him, this seems like a great thing to do, Lord, but is this really what you want? Is this your will for me? And um, so we see that David did have good intentions. He did want to do something very nice for his God. But we see down in verse 5 that when Nathan went home and, and the Lord spoke to Nathan, and we're going to find out that Nathan's original comment wasn't from the Lord at all. It didn't come from God at all. Do whatever you want, Dave. The Lord will bless it. He's with you. You can do whatever you want. That wasn't God speaking. That was Nathan maybe trying to be nice to the king, whatever it might be. But what we're going to read here is we are going to read a vision and a prophecy that's going to come from God himself to Nathan and then from Nathan to David. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Verse 6. Well, he says, are you going to build a house for me to dwell in? He says, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day. But I've moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, I have ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all of your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, nor shall the sons of the wicked, of wickedness, oppress them any more. As previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. I love that. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? <clears throat> so the question, you know, when we come to church, we walk in here, um, a lot of times you hear the phrase, um, this is the house of the Lord, right? Is it? Does he sleep here at night? Is this where he camps out when we're gone and we're at home? Does he have maybe an office down the hallway or something or access to the kitchen so he can snack at night or whatever? Absolutely not. Dumb question, retort, you know. But no, when we leave, he goes with us, doesn't he? Whithersoever we go, he goes with us. How can that be? Well, there's this thing called omnipresence, where God is so powerful and so awesome that he can be everywhere in the same place at one time. That's why when we pray, it's so important because we need to understand that you could pray for somebody over in China. And as far as the Lord's concerned, they're just as close as the person sitting next to you. There's no long distance charge. <laughs> the signal doesn't weaken as it travels over there. We have access to God anytime we want. Because wherever you go, you take him with you. Now, we can sit here and think, wow, that's really cool. Or we could think, to ourselves, I better watch out where I go. Where am I taking him? Am I taking him to places that he would like to be in or not? That's something we should dwell on. I, I, I think that's important. It has a lot to do with how we live our lives. And we know from studying David as we've gone through these, these uh, books of Samuel you know, David didn't hit a home run every time he got up to bat. As a matter of fact, David struck out many times uh, to the point of almost disgrace and embarrassment. He lived with the enemy. He co-conspirated with the enemy. Um, a lot of things took place that we saw David doing that did not appear uh, very godly. So when God is talking to David through Nathan, he reminds David very quickly in verse 8, I took you from the sheepfold. I took you from following the sheep. You had the most degrading, simple job that any human being could ever have. Anybody can tend the sheep. 
Anybody can sit on a hill and watch the sheep graze. But I took you from there, and I made you to be the ruler over my people, Israel. It's interesting that we've seen many promises and prophecies concerning David. Some came from Samuel, and now they're coming from Nathan. And even King Saul had said some pretty prophetic things concerning David, saying, I know that you're going to be the king. I know that you're going to sit on the throne. He was speaking things that hadn't taken place yet, that were yet future events. Sometimes, as we're going to see here tonight, sometimes when God is speaking like he is with David, sometimes he'll speak in the now with his words, and then at the click of a finger, he'll speak of something that is very, very, very yet future, perhaps in the same sentence or in the same paragraph. So it's important for us to understand that when we are deciphering some of the things that are being said here. One of the things he said um, that we read here, that this nation of Israel would never have to move again. That it would never be encompassed by its enemies again. And we know that that, as far as David was concerned, never came to pass. All the days of David, there was war. There were threats. So what's God talking about here? Is he talking about David in the present tense and then jumps way out into the far, far future, maybe even beyond where we're at today? Because Israel still isn't safe. It's still surrounded by its enemies. And it was carried away to Assyria and to Babylon because of their sin and their rebellion against God. So we have this really cool um, mixture here as we go ahead and continue reading this from, from him. And David, it says that you have, that God made you a great name. I've been with you wherever you've gone, David, even when you were dribbling in front of the king trying to act like you were crazy. Even when you were um, being a traitor to your own people, offering to go to battle against your own blood. I was with you there, David. I built you, David. You know, there's this beautiful thing in the Bible where I think it's in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah goes to the potter, and he sees the potter working on the potter's wheel. And God tells him to watch the, the guy form the clay into a vase or a container of some kind. The whole idea that you and I are a lump of clay, literally. We come from the earth. We go back to the earth. Jesus takes us as this lump of clay, and puts us on his potter's wheel. And he begins to create something. That's why in Corinthians we read that scripture where it says, You are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. And all things have become new. That should be good news for us tonight. I am really happy that all things have become new for me in my life. Right? Right? The Lord's reminding David, you're a chunk of clay on my wheel. I found you on the side of a hill, a chunk of clay, and I took you, and I formed you, and I shaped you to be a great man. Were any of you here years ago when I had that potter come and do his little demonstration for everybody? One of the things he did before he created anything was he took the clay and he put it on a table and he took a bat and he started beating on it. And he took a roller and he started rolling it with a roller. And then he'd wad it up again and then he'd roll it out and mash it again. And we're sitting there thinking, okay, this is great. He's killing the clay. But what he was doing was he was, he was getting all the air out of it. And also, the more you work clay, 
the more softer it becomes. But you have to have water in order to do that. And we know that in the Bible, Jesus speaks of living water. The Holy Spirit being living water. That living water being sprinkled into that lump of clay. And then watching him spin the wheel and create something out of nothing. He took the most common material found on the planet and made something special out of it. You. And most of us, we're still spinning on the wheel, right? We're still being worked on. But we also know that in our Christian lives that we're going to go through difficult times. Heated times in our lives. Now, if I'm that vessel that he's formed, and I have to go through the heated times, through the calm, and the great heat, if there's one little air bubble left in me, I will explode. That's why it's so important when the potter is working with the clay, that he sees to it that there is nothing in there that will cause that to, no air bubbles, no impurities, no lumps. It's all nice and pliable and workable. <clears throat> He's telling David that very thing right here. David, I found you on the side of a hill. You've done some cool things, Dave. You, you know, you killed Goliath. You've won a lot of victories. But you've done some really stupid things too, David. So I'm the one that's been following you all the way through this journey that we've been on together. I've been there for you. I preserved your life because, well, I made a promise, first of all. God always keeps his promises. That promise was originally made to Abram many, many, many years earlier. And that, that same promise has been passed down to David. And he's making that promise to David because he has a plan for David. He has a plan for you and I that is just important in his eyes as any plan that he might have. I've been with you, verse 9. I've cut off your enemies. I've made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. This is all speaking of the present moment in time as David is hearing these words. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them. I love that wording, don't you? I'm going to plant them. You know, what's, 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 what's the inference there? Why didn't he just say, I'm going to find this mountain with a bunch of rocks on it, and you're going to build a city there? And that's where you're going to be. What's he use the phrase plant for? I think it's very interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> and that's what I love about the, New Test or the Old Testament is we can pull from the Old Testament things that apply to us today in our own Christian lives. When we first came out here to start the church, it was referred to as a church plant. That we were going to come to Sheridan and we were going to plant these little churchy seeds. And we were going to let them sprout and grow. And we were going to stay with it until they bear fruit. So we were planted here. Sometimes people will ask other people, are you planted in a church anywhere? To be planted somewhere means I have roots. My roots are going down. And it also means that I'm in good soil. I have to be in the right soil in order for my roots to get the nourishment that goes up into my little leaves, which creates these little flowers, which down the road creates these little berries, and I bear fruit. Because I was properly planted in a good place. By streams of living water. He's telling David the very same thing here. But he's looking here over thousands of years. Not just a generation, 
but thousands of years into the future it will take for this process, for this little plant that's been planted to reach its fruition to where we see it truly beginning to bear fruit from all the great things that God has done. Verse 11, he says, Since the time that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel, I've caused you to rest from all your enemies. And also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. I love that. You want to build me a house, Dave? Nah, don't worry about it. But I'm going to build you a house. Your house is going to be eternal, forever. There will have no end to the line of David, to the kingdom of David. Because we know today what's going to come from David's line. The Messiah, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, the true son of David, who will rule and reign forever. So I'm going to build you a house, Dave. Verse 12, And when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be, future, established forever before you. And your throne shall be established forever. What a promise. According to all these words and according to all this vision. So he's not only hearing it, he's seeing it. I would have loved to have known what his vision looked like that Nathan was having. So Nathan spoke to David. Nothing but good news here. Nothing but encouraging words here. The future looks bright. And you know, <clears throat> excuse me, God promises us over and over and over again, especially in the Old Testament as he's talking to his people, if you will hear my commandments, if you will hear my word and keep them, I will bless you. You will become great. You will not have need. I will be your God and you will be my people. Those are the promises that God passes down to us tonight that we can call our own. But there's a big fat condition attached to the promise. What do I do with it? What am I going to do with it? Because even though God made these great promises to me, I still have a free will. I can still say, you know, I'm not really interested in your promises. As a matter of fact, I don't believe they would ever come to pass. So I'm kind of a hopeless guy, and I'm just going to go out and live the way I want to live without being accountable to you or anybody else. Couldn't make that choice. Then the fat question comes. Ultimately, is God's will going to be performed in my life even though I'm saying no today? Well, I believe the answer is yes. If I'm his son and he's called me to something or whatever it might be, I can run until I run out of pavement. But sooner or later, I'm going to find my way back and I'm going to accomplish those purposes that God had for me all along. So there's two things I want to just throw out there to you. God's will. How many times do people say, I just don't know what God's will is. How do you find God's will? Well, most of the time we find it, I should say all the time, we find it through prayer 
And we find it through his word. And we also find it through people who he has gifted who might give us insight into what God's will would be for us. So is there two different kinds of God's will? Is there God's perfect will? Tom, I have established a path for you to walk on. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Keep your eyes on me and I will make you prosper. I will make you bloom. I will bring fruit in your life. It will be my perfect will for you. So here's what I do. I take off and I get off the path and I'm way over here somewhere and things aren't working very good for me. I'm so far from God's perfect will that I don't even think he thinks about me anymore. But ultimately, ultimately, he begins to reel us back in. When we've had enough of the world, when we've lost the sense of, I can do it myself. I don't need God. When we start to realize just how needy we truly are, the Holy Spirit begins to draw us back again. It might happen through difficult circumstances. But in the end, when you're old and you're sitting in your chair, you'll sit back and you'll say, I have to tell you the truth. God's will was ac accomplished in my life. Could I have done it easier? Could I have saved myself from a lot of heartache and pain and other people from heartache and pain if I would have just stayed on the path that God laid out for me? Absolutely. So I couldn't keep God's perfect will, but God's will ultimately was fulfilled in my life, even though I took the long way home. And then we look at that and we say, wait a minute. God is so amazing. If I would not have taken the long way home, I would have never went through all of those defeats and loneliness and heartache and desperation and hopelessness that I went through, which brought me back to the cross. Interesting, isn't it, how that works? We see the same thing in David. David took the long way around, didn't he? And one of the things that's really great about it is the Lord's not sitting here going, you know, I gave you chance after chance, Dave, and this is your last chance, man. You need to get your act together. We're not doing this going around the block thing anymore. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm not sure that I should make these great promises to you, David, because you have let me down so many times already. Would you trust him? Would you trust somebody who backstabbed you over and over and over again? And one day they come to you and say, I've had a change of heart. Please forgive me and trust me. Wouldn't we say, ooh, that's going to be a little bit difficult. Because your track record isn't very good. That's just how we would respond. But here's the beautiful thing. God doesn't treat us like that. He doesn't respond to our failures like that. As a matter of fact, he's not even mentioning them here. Scripture tells us that when we come to Christ, when we are forgiven of our sin, that all of our sin has been cast as far as the east is from the west. It's been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. And these are God's words. I will remember them no more. How many of you believe that to be true? That you've seen that principle in your life? He doesn't upbraid us. He doesn't stand there and scold us. And he's not doing that with David because this is a huge turning point in David's life. The wars have ceased. And by the way, we're going to find out in a chapter or two that it's really not good all the time, to not have any war going on in your life. We go through spiritual battles in our life as Christians. When you get to that point in your life where everything's perfect, 
Everything's great. All your bills are paid. You won the lottery. You're sailing on your sailboat somewhere out in the Bahamas. When you get to that place, I can almost guarantee you that you'll begin to loosen your grip on God. What is it that keeps my grip so tight to the Lord? It's because I know that he will bring me through every trial, every tribulation, everything that's negative in my life. And not only bring me through it, but make me better from it. When I went and spent a few years away, my pastor wrote me a letter and said something to me that I've always held on to for 40 years now. He said, Tom... You can allow this to make you bitter, or you can allow it to make you better. And there's only one letter in those two words that are different. But that one letter is eternity, isn't it? That one letter is bitter or better. And they're so far apart, they're an eternity apart. David has that opportunity, you have that opportunity. All of us have the opportunity to allow the things of life to make us better, not bitter. And another thing that's interesting about the trials that we go through uh, on your spare time and your reading, look at, uh, I believe it's 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, where Paul's talking about how we go through these trials and God comforts us in all of our trials. Why? so that we might comfort those who are going through the same kind of trials with the same comfort or with we were comforted with. So if I've never gone through any trials, how would I truly be able to reach out and comfort someone when I can't even relate to what they're going through? When somebody has a great loss and then someone walks up to them and says, I know exactly how you're feeling. I bet they just want to smack them. Because no, you don't know how I'm feeling. And if you think that's comforting me, it doesn't comfort me. You know, sometimes people just want you to put their arm around them and tell them you love them and just hold them. Sometimes that's better than millions of words. But anyway, I want to get back to our, uh, our passage here. He's talking about this uh, leader of the king. He said, my mercy shall not depart from him in verse 15, the way I took it from Saul, who I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you. David, you have nothing to do with the outcome of this. This is all me, God is saying. And he's saying that to me tonight. Yes, you've made the right choices, you've chose to follow me, but the fruit, the growth, the outcome of it all is from the hand of God in every single one of our lives. Now look how David responds. I love this. And then King David went in and he sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? What do you see in me? What do you see in me that you would bring me this far? And yet, he says in verse 19, And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. In this, the manner of man, or is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Can any man do this? Is this the way of men? Absolutely not. This is the way of God. Only God could do this. And for your word's sake, verse 21. Oh, verse 20, I'm sorry. Now, what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, you know your servant. You know me. You know me inside and out. You know my thoughts before I even think them. Did you guys know that? God knows our thoughts before we even think them. When them little chemicals are moving around 
and those electrical sparks are going off in there, and these thoughts are forming. He already knows them. Wow. I need to make sure that those chemicals and sparks are thinking right, because he already knows. Can't fool God. <laughs> you know your servant. And for your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. So why is he doing it? Because David's cool? Why is he doing it? Because he wants these wonderful people to have this wonderful blessing of being a nation? No, the bottom line is he's doing it because he promised he would. That's what it says. You're doing it for your word's sake. You're doing it according to your heart, not my heart. David could get on his knees and say, Lord, I want a great giant house to live in and a beautiful throne and all these great victories and all this kind of stuff. And God could say, okay, David, I'm going to do that for you. Well, that's not how it works. God does it for him. God does it for his glory. God does it because that's what's in his heart. We, we are the beneficiaries of that. We're the ones that get blessed as God does what's in his heart. For his sake. Verse 22, therefore you are great, O Lord God. Hmm. I love this. There is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make for himself a name and to do so for yourself Great and awesome deeds for your land, before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt and the nations of their gods. Notice something there, a little theme going through there? Huh? It's all about God, isn't it? It's done for you. It's done by you. It's done because of you. Verse 24, for you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, O Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. How important for us to be in agreement with the Lord. You know, there's that old hymn, Have Thine Own Way. And what are some of the words? I am the what? You are the potter, and I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waited, yielded, and still. David is understanding, he's recognizing, wow, God is going to do great things. And he's going to do it for his name's sake. That's the whole reason. You know, there's some psalms that you'll read that David wrote when he was really desperate and <clears throat> going through really tough times. And, and he would say phrases like, Lord, for your name's sake, destroy my enemy. For your name's sake. Because, Lord, if you let my enemy destroy me, what are the nations going to think about you as a God? As the only true, powerful God? Won't they mock you? So, you know what? For your name's sake, Lord, save me from my enemies. And he did. Over and over again. Verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God. Your words are true. And you have promised this goodness to your servant. 
Now therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. Do you think David understood what he was saying here? When he was using these words, forever. David knew that we grow old and we die. David knew, just like his son Solomon came to know, that you work so hard all of your life to make things nice. And you acquire things and you have accomplishments. And then you die. And your children come along and squander it all. They don't appreciate what you did for them. They just go out and party until it's all gone. Solomon saw that. David understood that. So it would be very, very difficult for David to say, I know for a fact that that's never going to happen in all of my lineage all the way down forever and ever and ever. And you know as well as I do, <laughs> that if anything, it was the opposite. Just about every leader, every king, every person that was put in a place of authority was rotten, selfish, thought they were better than God. They compromised. They worshipped other gods. They led, the, they led the people astray. And, you know, the principle of that is still working today. That when a person who's in leadership leads his people astray, that person is accountable for that. That person is going to have to give an answer to the Lord. I don't think there is an answer. You know, I think that those leaders, whether they're in the secular world or church or whatever, when they have to stand before the Lord, I don't think one word will come out of their mouth. I think they'll be without excuse, and they'll know that just because of where they're standing at the moment. What can I say, <laughs> right? I'm guilty. So we're going to see that even through the stupidity, selfishness, and failure of human beings, God's plan will still move forward. Even though so many things might step in and try to snuff it out, his plan will continue to move forward. Now, I was thinking earlier, as we wrap this up tonight, then that one chapter, well, that's all I could do for you tonight. Um, but because I think it's a really, really important part of our study uh, to draw a correlation between these things and our things with God. We've been talking about a little bit in our prayer, and people talk about this every day, of what kind of a mess our nation is in. We talk about it all the time. Well, let me rephrase that. We complain about it all the time. We murmur about it all the time. But what have we done about it? Well, I'll tell you what we've done. And not us. But I'm talking about this nation. I'm talking about the whole nation that clings to absolutes and morals and, and God-founded country have stood by quietly and let it happen. That's why part of the responsibility falls on my lap because I've done nothing. I can't even, we can't even get people to go out and vote. We can't get people to go out and share their faith. They're afraid. 
We can't get whistleblowers to tell the truth because they're afraid they might lose their job or their family or be ridiculed or be in the press. Therefore, we've sat back. And what do you expect is going to happen when good does not prevail in a nation? Evil's going to win every single time. I want to pray and say, Lord, if there's anything that I can do to promote goodness, if it's not too late, even to just change one person's mind about the things of God. And you know there's enough of us to do that. Matter of fact, we're pretty much split right down the middle in this country. It's about half and half. Half believers, half heathens. Half believers, half hell fodder. Kindling for hell over here. But we want to pull them out of there, don't we? Because we've let them run rampant. We've allowed leaders to be put in office that we knew were not good. But you know, it's not really my business. I have a nine to five job and I collect a salary and I pay my taxes and you know, as long as I can raise my family, I, I really don't want to get in the weeds over there. That's the problem. Now I'm not saying we should all become political crazy people. But I think we should ponder that, that's all. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the time that we've had tonight. And Lord, this chapter that we've looked at this evening is so filled with you. And it, it, it's so real and raw. And Lord, that's the kind of relationship we need to have with you. A real, raw relationship that we know who we are we know where you found us may we never forget that may we always be thankful to you that you saved us and be thankful to you lord that you do not change i heard someone say it earlier you're the same yesterday today forever and these principles that we've studied tonight are just as real today as they were in David's time. And that we can apply these things to our lives. That we can find the path that you've laid out for us. So if we uh, leave here tonight, Lord, I know that you're going to go with each one of us. But perhaps help us to ponder our relationships with you. To sit back, maybe take a couple steps back and maybe look at ourselves from a different perspective and try to see what you see. And maybe there's some things there that need to be adjusted. Maybe some repentance is in order. God, just take our hearts and let us walk by faith, believing in you all the way. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin forever and ever. Amen. Amen.